Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Emily Arman. I am uh, talking this morning about uh, National Register documentation of dance hall buildings. Uh, specifically, uh, the ones that I've been working on are uh, in this region of South Louisiana. And, um, <clears throat> and the, the specific format is a multiple property submission or multiple property documentation form. So, um, some of you are probably familiar, but maybe not all of you. Uh, the National Register of Historic Places is it's the official uh, national list of buildings that are considered worthy of preservation. So it's overseen by the Department of the Interior, specifically the National Park Service. And um, there are some uh, you know, benefits to having your building listed on the National Register. Um, it's also not um, a solve everything. You know, it won't solve all of your problems. It won't <laughs> keep your dance hall open necessarily or make money fall from the sky. Um, it also won't actually prevent demolition of a building um, or restrict the use in any way um, unless there's some limited protection for federal, uh, federally funded or federally approved projects, which uh, Gail's uh, Club Desire presentation was a good example of how that provides some but not absolute protection uh, for historic buildings. Um, what it can do is uh, provide some access access to uh, tax incentives um, or other grants, uh, as Steph McDougall mentioned a little bit about that yesterday. Um, and it can provide a certain level of status and um, encouragement for preservation. So, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily always work like this, but the best case scenario is that it can, um, it can sort of encourage a community to look at a building in a way that they uh, maybe didn't before um, and you know help people to rally around the cause of potentially um, saving a building so uh, buildings that are or properties that are listed on the national register of historic places can be listed individually uh, they can be listed as part of a district which is a collection of buildings that are all in one place um, or uh, there's, there's also a multiple property uh, submission, which is a collection of thematically related buildings that aren't necessarily next to one another. Um, so if there is you know, a certain type of building that, that shares a history, um, you can, uh, you can you know, submit one of these forms. It doesn't automatically um, nominate all the buildings. You know, once, once we submit this, it's not gonna be that all dance halls are you know, now listed on the National Register. But it's intended to um, help facilitate and streamline the process of nominating individual buildings. So, you know, in the case of a Cajun dance hall, you don't have to say, well, it started in Nova Scotia every time that you want to list an individual building on the National Register. So it establishes, let's see, the components are here. It establishes the historic context that all of these properties have in common. So what is their story? What are the components of that story? It includes a statement of significance. Um, how did these buildings contribute to that story? Why are they important? Um, it establishes one or more building types. Uh, so, so you know, you try to categorize buildings, describe them, what is it, and what makes it what it is, essentially. And then there's a list of registration requirements, which is um, the qualities that an individual property should have or retain in order to be considered eligible for the National Register. So ideally, you know, if this works properly, you should be able to use it as a template for an individual property and, uh, and sort of be able to determine, you know, whether it's likely to be listed on the National Register. And then you can point to things like those historic context, the, you know, the descriptions, the physical characteristics, uh, things like that in your nomination for the individual building. This is just an example of what the form looks like. It's much longer than that, that's just one page. <laughs> so, um, dance halls, you know, dance halls overall, even dance halls in Louisiana, even dance halls in South Louisiana are very complicated. Um, you know, the, the history is very muddy. It's very difficult to box them in, which is exactly what you're trying to do with this form. So it's, it can feel a little bit counterintuitive to go through this exercise, 
but it also really uh, kind of forces you to, to really dig into the history, the sort of nitty gritty of the you know, physical characteristics of these buildings. Um, in Louisiana specifically, as you've, as you've heard before, um, you know, we, we had quite a few of these resources in the past. Not many of them are still there today. Uh, the ones that are there, many of them have been you know, neglected um, have just deteriorated and you know, are, are in very bad shape and are in danger of being lost already. So, um, so in this case, I, I narrowed my study to a, to a geographic area, and then I, you know, I kind of started by looking at the properties that I knew were still there, um, and, and sort of, you know, almost working backwards, trying to establish a context and establish a story for those buildings in this area. So this is the geographic area that I used. It's uh, you know the, the area officially designated as Acadiana um, in the in the southern parishes of Louisiana, the French-speaking parishes of Louisiana. Um, and you can see on the right, that's that map is um, actually started with uh, Hud Sharp's data uh, from the list of you know buildings and locations that he started to compile and um, and map them with GIS, and you can see that um, you can see that the distribution of dance halls of these type really kind of follows that um, Acadiana region pretty closely. And this the center is in what's known as the Cajun heartland, the kind of heart of those parishes. So um, the kind of guiding factor that I used for these properties was music. Um, there are three types of music that are considered indigenous to this region, um, Cajun music, Creole music, including Zydeco, and Swamp Pop. Um, so that, those were the three historic contexts, contexts that I ended up writing. Now, this is very, very basic. It's intended to be added on to later. Um, you know, there, there are more aspects of each of these contexts that can be added. Um, each of these contexts can probably be divided up into three or more, you know, shorter time spans. Um, but, you know, for the beginning, so that we have something to work with, this is, this is where we're starting. So, the first two contexts um, sort of uh, follow the two cultures uh, that are prominent here, Cajun and Creole. And they cover a time period from about 1900 to about 1985 which actually corresponds with the, um, the buildings that we know still exist, even though it, you know, the context actually starts in the mid-18th uh, mid century when um, you know, people started to settle in this region. Swamp Pop is, uh, is a much shorter context. It's more related to the music. Um, it was, um, you know, it's, it's a genre that was explored by both black and white. Um, for a very relatively short period of time, about 10 years, um, you know, fell out of popularity. But overall, you know, the, the cultural development during this time period, um, for both Cajun and Creole um, people here, follows a, a loose pattern of relative cultural isolation, um, you know, speaking almost exclusively French, um, to, you know, gradual assimilation and growth, um, you know, larger communities, more influence from popular culture, you know, from the rest of the United States, and then, um, and then, sort of after these contexts are over, a period of uh, cultural promotion, um, you know, tourism started to become a big deal here. Um, the, the Cajun and real culture started sort of promoting themselves to everyone else out there, um, and it became, you know, a little bit more about that and less about you know internal community gathering and that sort of thing, although that that was still a factor. Um, and Swamp Pop fell at a time that, that sort of represents the peak of that assimilation right before uh, you know the, the cultural promotion era began um, in the late 60s. So um, so, you know, when you talk about the Cajun and Creole cultures in South Louisiana, you, you can't really have one without the other. Um, you know, both influenced each other tremendously. 
um, although they were still separate, mostly because of Jim Crow segregation, um, you know, racial issues. Um, but, you know, they were both primarily French speaking, used the same types of instruments, um, mostly agricultural. Um, and uh, they, there are a lot of parallels in their stories as far as the music and the use of dance halls. Um, so there, so the, the context, either, even though there are separate contexts for each culture, you know, each refer, references the other quite a bit. Um, so just some very brief points about Cajun, the development of Cajun music, um, Acadian settlement in the mid 18th century, also Anglo-American and other European immigrants who were in the area. That's why you have a lot of Cajun McGees here in Louisiana now. Uh, the, the Acadian cultural norms eventually became the uh, dominant uh, you know, social norms here, and everything kind of melded together, more or less. Um, started with house dances that were usually uh, you know, a couple of musicians in a corner in a house. Uh, gradually moved toward commercial dance halls. I think the first the first reference of a, of a public dance hall that I found was in, was in the 1860s, um, but it certainly became you know a lot more common into the 20th century. That uh, in turn had a had a pretty profound effect on the music. Um, you know, as musicians moved into larger spaces, they needed more volume, playing for larger crowds could fit more musicians. Um, in the 20s and 30s, uh, you, had, you had a lot of um, the accordion, which had been used for a while, kind of dropped out. Uh, everything became sort of string-based and had a lot of Western swing influence. After World War II, uh, when people came back from the war, uh, there, was a, there was sort of a level of homesickness that, that caused kind of a resurgence of the traditional Cajun music. But at the same time, you know, it was the rock and roll era. People here were discovering Elvis Presley right along with the rest of the United States. And that's when uh, swamp pop really began to develop. Creole music, obviously you have African Americans coming here um, for slavery, also Haitian Revolution um, settlement in the very late 18th century. Um, there were musical styles, uh, musical traditions that were more Afro-Caribbean influenced, um, they still spoke primarily French here. Um, dance halls, I didn't find as many references quite as early here. It's, it's sort of a chicken or egg thing, but it seems like um, dance halls really became more common with, um, you know, more urban music styles, gaining popularity, R&B, you know, they were very common by the 1940s, but it was maybe more of a, more of a 20th century thing. Um, also had house dances that became less common as time went on. Um, the larger dance halls are reported to have, have led to um, a faster dancing style, less variation in the music, and what kind of ended up being considered zotico, which is which is a very fast, you know, dance type of music. Um, trail rides in the 1970s are included in this context very briefly. It was a, a sort of an ode to the cattle ranching lifestyle of the 19th century. Um, those are still popular today, and there are certain dance halls, you know, that have ranch in the name. Frank's Ranch and Lawtel would be an example of that, um, that were commonly used for the big dance at the end of the trail ride. And in the 1980s, um, there was a sort of a resurgence of Zotico music um, as, as I read it in a few places, I, you know, I checked a couple times first. Um, a couple people told me that the song Don't Mess With My Toot Toot by Rock and Sydney in 1985 sort of saved Zotico music for, you know, for the youth um, at that time. And uh, so, you know, Zotico music is still very popular today, as we all know. And then Swamp Pop um, developed sort of like rockabilly music in the early 1950s. Uh, you know, people in this region were hearing rock and roll music, trying to emulate it, uh, but still retain some of the influences of the traditional music of the region. Um, the term Swamp Pop wasn't coined until I think the 1970s, uh, so it wasn't intended to be its own thing necessarily. Um, but as I said before, um, 
it does sort of represent the peak of assimilation. You know, you even had uh, band members changing their names to sound more American, even though you do have the, a couple of battos in this photo um, who hadn't necessarily changed their names. Okay, so I concentrated on one building type, even though there certainly are more that can be added later, and I'll talk about that. So what is a dance hall? We see one here in uh, Mamu in 1919, shows up on a Sanborn map. We have several of these that show up on Sanborn maps, um, you know, early on in very, very small towns. Chitania, Basile, uh, which are somehow in the Library of Congress stand <laughs> for, uh, for us to find. Uh, but, you know, pretty, mu pretty much in every small community that's represented in this way um, in the first half of the 20th century, you can find a dance hall somewhere one year. Uh, Mamu actually had two this year in 1919. It's a large building, it's larger than most of the buildings around it. And that's an example of a Wednesday night dance in Mamu in 1953 in the same part of town. I can tell you what a dance hall is not. One example is actually one of the uh, places where you know Cajun music and Cajun dancing is most popular now, Fred's Lounge, which is on that same street in Mamu, uh, but it's a small building. It was always intended to be a bar. Um, I talked to Taunt Sue, who is um, technically retired, but still basically runs the place. Um, she said that it was, it was never intended to be a place for dancing, uh, but you know, she admitted that dancing had really been a large part of it since the very beginning, you know, but in 1946. Lounge, I'll mention that later, is a, is a separate building type that could also be incorporated into this, uh, into this submission at a later time. So, dance halls, as I've defined them for this, are uh, constructed or repurposed specifically for live music and dancing. Uh, repurposed because a lot of these buildings really did start out of stores, um, you know, different large building types that were just repurposed for, for dancing. Um, and they primarily hosted music of one of the three uh, genres that are considered indigenous to this region. Most of them were privately owned. Um, they did evolve from house dances. Uh, they were commercial buildings, so they were, um, you know, they did, they did have some influence uh, or some incentive to make money, uh, which probably made them more likely to um, you know, bring in bands of other genres, whatever was popular at the time, uh, you know, which in turn influenced the uh, Cajun and Creole music, and, you know, it gets very muddy. So, there were other genres. Uh, some, I think, some Creole dance halls that started out uh, playing swamp pop music eventually ended up playing Zotico music when that became the, 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 you know, more popular genre. And, um, as far as these, they're not tourism oriented. They're internal, you know, community spaces. Uh, they're not oriented outward. I included this statement also. Um, it's important to note with these resources that overall they're in very poor condition. Uh, there aren't very many that are left. Um, many of them have sat vacant for long periods of time. They're deteriorating. Uh, and so, you know, essentially we don't have a whole lot to work with as far as uh, listing a lot of properties on the National Register. So these are just some examples of the physical characteristics that I you know, pulled out of um, a survey of basically all of the dance halls in this area that I could find that were still there. I know there are some more that have turned up, um, and I'll be you know, expanding and adding to that as I can. Um, but you can see in bold a few examples there. Interior configuration. Obviously, large open floor space, stage that's delineated either by elevation or a balustrade on the floor. Um, some that were built later in the 1950s and 60s, the ones more associated with Swamp Pop, had um, you know mezzanine levels, more complicated floor plans, sometimes multiple bars. Oh, and then later on. Um, I think this was more 1970s, 1980s, but I did notice several Zotico dance halls that had a small uh, service window 
that opened directly onto the dance floor that had a kitchen beyond it, uh, so you could just order food right at the dance hall. Um, that seemed to be limited to those buildings. Setting and use, where can you find these buildings? That's part of this um, description as well. Um, community centers, either in or outside of community centers, whether that's a town or whether it's you know a rural community. Something that I didn't mention here also is um, there were several that I found that were on um, you know outside of the center of a community, but on someone's private property. So if someone you know someone lives on a property, they have some extra space, they built a dance hall and opened it there. Um, and I, there were two uh, that were still standing that still had the, they were vacant, but the original owner was still living next door, it was still there on the property. Um, and then there was one, I think, that, that had been, but had recently been torn down. Some are located in mixed use buildings. Um, there are a couple that are located in, uh, on campgrounds um, and function as sort of the you know, community gathering center there as well. Uh, those are kind of more mid 20th century. Um, there are also dinner clubs uh, that were mostly, you know, mid 20th century as well, mostly associated with swamp pop music. And then subtypes um, that fit with the three historic contexts, uh, Cajun, Creole, Exotico, and swamp pop. Uh, the biggest distinction really between the Cajun and Creole halls is whether they were white owned or black owned. Uh, and you know, and attended by uh, you know Cajun or Creole people. Um, down below those photos, you can see you know there aren't a whole lot of distinctions between the building types, but there are a couple of little things that, that are somewhat distinct. The swamp pop dance halls uh, that you know were built at a time uh, when there were highways being built. They were built along highways. They were larger. Um, a lot of times they tried to have a more upscale environment. Uh, if you went to the Southern Club, you might have noticed the call buttons on the columns next to the tables where you could call your waiter. Um, you know, so there was much more of that sort of, uh, you know, trying to create that environment that isn't really present in the other two types. So, the National Register outlines a system of criteria of significance. Um, if a building is important, it can be important for, you know, one of these basic reasons. There are three criteria that fit somewhat with these dance halls. Primarily, criterion A, which is associated with events read around here, that have made significant contributions to the broad patterns of our history. Um, so that the pattern of that history is uh, music and cultural development in this region. Um, there is a possibility for uh, significance for a specific dance hall under criterion B, which is association with um, a significant person or event? No. Um, criterion B is association with a specific person. Uh, so if there's a dance hall that was either owned by a significant musician or a significant musician was the house band, um, you know, Clifton Chenier played here is not a qualification for Criterion B. If you're familiar with the historic preservation cliche, George Washington slept here, Clifton Chenier played here is sort of the equivalent of that for Louisiana dance halls. Um, but, you know, the dance hall that he owned could certainly be uh, considered significant under Criterion B, for example. Criterion C, um, architecture and design. Uh, you know, these, these buildings are not particularly architecturally distinct from other vernacular commercial architecture in the region at the time or from, you know, other dance halls in regions with similar climate. Um, there was, for, for a period of time, uh, in the Cajun dance halls, there were a couple of features. Uh, one was the dog pen where the young men were, you know, had to stay basically in this sort of pinned in area between dances. Um, that was unique to these. Also, there was a separate room uh, where people would leave the very young children while they danced that was prominent in, uh, in early Cajun dance halls, fell out of favor later on as children weren't uh, allowed in the dance halls at all after a certain you know, period of time. Uh, we don't know of any left that have those features still, but if we found one, certainly it would be uh, eligible, I think, under Criterion C for those specific features. 
And here are a couple of examples. This is a dance hall near Crowley in 1938. Thank goodness for these WPA photographs because um, you know, they, they show it very well. So, registration requirements. This is the part that is still, uh, that still needs the most development. Um, this is the, the part of the form that, where you're supposed to outline, you know, what do you have to have, what do you have to still have in order to be eligible for the National Register. Um, a lot of these buildings have been heavily modified over time. Um, you know, they've deteriorated quite a bit. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've tried to make the registration requirements as open and inclusive as possible, um, but I'm still working on them. So, integrity uh, for the National Register purposes. There are ways to evaluate um, integrity, which is how much a building retains its um, basically the, the essence of what it was historically, and how well it still conveys that vis visually. Um, so as far as the essential physical features that would be required, I think for dance halls, the overall form and the interior configuration are the most important. We have, here's a picture. So the bottom left corner here is uh, what used to be Abe's Palace in Eunice. It was built in 1901, and, uh, and on the exterior is a you know, very common looking two-story brick commercial building um, on Laurel Street in, uh, in Eunice. And the second floor was a dance hall beginning in 1901. It closed in 1940, and it is, uh, you know, there are reports that, it, that it played, they played this kind of music there, they played Cajun music there mostly. Uh, I believe Amadeo Arroyo performed there. Um, and now, you know, the interior, I think they still have the original floors, and in some places they still have uh, the old tin, uh, pressed tin ceiling, uh, although some of the panels have been taken off and kind of moved into other, you know, used for wall finishes and things like that. But the whole second floor is now divided up into luxury apartments. Uh, and it, it doesn't, you know, convey its to the dance hall anymore really at all. So, there are seven aspects of integrity from, uh, that are, you know, included in the National Register of Historic Places. Um, these can all apply for the most part. Location, there are a couple of dance halls that have been moved that normally automatically, you know, pretty much disqualifies a building from being listed. Uh, the location is important for these because they were, you know, the heart of a community or they were out in the country, uh, you know, at a certain time they were on the interstate between two towns, you know, later on. And so the, the location, you know, the, you know, the context changed over time as the culture of the music developed. And that's, a, that's an important part of their significance. Um, the design, of course, the configuration of the dance hall um, setting, although some, uh, I know Hamilton's place specifically in Lafayette was out in the country when it was first built and now it's just swallowed up by the city. Um, for the most part, a lot of these buildings still have a similar setting to when they were uh, first built. <laughs> Materials and workmanship are a little bit more uh, gray. Uh, you know, there were not very high quality materials used. There's been a lot of deterioration as far as the materials go. Um, integrity of feeling and association, I think, are particularly important for these. Um, you know, essentially, it has to feel like a dance hall. So here's an example of a building that I've been told is the same building. I think it needs more investigation to really, uh, to really know that for sure. Uh, but this is, at one point in time, it was called the French Casino in Mamu, downtown Mamu. And it's this, this building that's outlined in red here. In the late 60s, it was moved out to Highway 104 um, in sort of a complex next to a lounge. The front facade was completely, uh, you know, completely changed. It was put on a different foundation. Uh, the interior of the building actually is, um, it's hard to take in all at once because it's full of furniture, but, uh, but it still very much conveys the sense that it's a dance hall. You know, it's still the big, large open space, um, but with it having been moved, the facade having changed so much, uh, you know, that one, is, that one is a little bit tricky as far as whether it could still be eligible. You could maybe make an argument that it was moved in the period of significance, since the period of significance is so broad, uh, and it sort of was, was 
two different types of dance halls in two different eras. Um, but I don't know about this one. So uh, later on, I think we can add more building types that are related to uh, these same historic contexts. Certainly, um, more historic contexts can be added as well, covering different genres, you know, R&B, uh, jazz, uh, that all had dance halls associated with them in uh, larger cities. You know, New Orleans is a big one. There aren't any dance halls in New Orleans that are included um, on this uh, nomination right now. Um, but also building types, lounges. Uh, there are lots of bars that were, uh, you know, not built intended to be dancing spaces, but that ended up, you know, being large gathering spaces for dancing. Fred's is a classic example. Um, I don't know if there are any residences that hosted uh, house dances very early on, but if there were, you know, certainly that would be an option as well. Um, Church and community halls that had uh, you know, public dances as a secondary use uh, what else could also be another building type, uh, as well as stores. Later on, um, you know, starting in 1980 with new lots in uh, Roebridge, uh, you started to have these uh, combination Cajun restaurant and dance halls. Um, if you've been to Randall's here in Lafayette, that's an example. Um, those are relatively recent. Um, you know, they're not necessarily historically significant yet, but I think they certainly will be. Um, it sort of represents the next, uh, the next era of, uh, you know, cultural development, sort of in that cultural promotion time period, uh, where, you know, we were trying to introduce ourselves to the rest of the world and saying, you know, come in and experience this. Um, a lot of those are still operating today, and a pretty significant thing about them, I think, is that they uh, reintroduced children to the dance hall experience. Um, you know, children weren't allowed in many of these dance halls by the 1970s, 1980s, and these were, um, you know, intended to be family-friendly places where the whole family could come and enjoy and learn. Festival grounds also, you know, I don't know, uh, I haven't explored that possibility really, but um, a lot of the, you know, Cajun and Zotico dancing that happens now um, and has since the 1960s uh, has been outdoors as part of, uh, you know, cultural festivals. Um, so that's, you know, definitely something to consider, I think, in the future as well. Um, Recording studios, you know, less less oriented with dancing, but recording, commercial recording, uh, certainly did have an effect on the development of the music, particularly swamp pop. Uh, so I think that would be something we might consider in the future as well. But we're starting here, the three historic contexts, the dance hall building type, and really kind of delving into what that is, what we have left, and, um, you know, what makes them eligible so that we can uh, hopefully list as many of these as possible on the National Register. Uh, the real test of it is going to be when we, you know, start trying to uh, actually nominate individual buildings using this form, um, and you know there might be some changes that come along when that happens. But um, I'm very open to uh, feedback, suggestions, uh, you know, for how this might be uh, developed further. Uh, and thank you all very much. <laughs>